really happy to be here. I mean, it's um, one of my first North American uh, talks at a microfocus event. Uh, so normally I lecture at universities or I lecture at much smaller conferences. So it's great to be able to spend some time with you guys. This is also a much more intimate crowd than I was able to handle at the uh, at the keynote. So let's make this a little bit more interactive. Um, so if you have questions at any time, just feel free to jump in. I mean, I've got some slides in here, but um, but I don't have to stick to the slides. But I, I do have some information that I'm hoping to share with you. This is the Data Science 101 class. So I'm going to try my best to be as vendor neutral as possible. And I'm also going to try my best to um, uh, sort of be as helpful as I can without diving into math, right? Because no one wants that. Although if you do want that, come to my 201 where we get a little bit more mathy. Um, so my goal here is uh, not to encourage everyone to hop on the socials. I guess they, uh, they're, we're morally obligated to tell you to tweet about us, which is great. Uh, this is your uh, 100th reminder to download the app. Uh, but what I really wanted to do here is um, talk about data science, not in the abstract, but in the context of security. Uh, I mentioned uh, during the keynote that I've been doing sort of data science and math and statistics and analytics, whatever you want to call it, for, for a long time. I've been doing it for almost 20 years now. Um, but I've learned that uh, there are some really important lessons that I've learned in the past five years about how to sort of implement data science and data science teams in particular in the context of cyber. And I know that some of you guys are either in the process of deploying analytical products or maybe you're building up your own data science team. So what I'm hoping to share with you today is just talk about some of the um, learnings that I've had around sort of people, process technology, and then um, sort of just enough of an understanding of the types of techniques that we found at Intercept to be super useful for the entire realm of cyber using sort of data science methods. Okay, is that fair? Make sense? Okay, so let's just dive right into it. Um, of course, the lawyers make me insert this here. Uh, there is some information that I might accidentally talk about that is related to future-facing products. Uh, so be aware, this is not a commitment, even though I am the CTO. So there you go. Uh, so what I do want to do is I want to talk about data science in particular. I just want to level set, right? What is data science? What is AI? What is ML? And really, it's, it's all about the kind of insane amount of noise I find in in, uh, in security. It's really funny. When I, when I went from analytics to security five years ago, it was like a different world, right? On the one hand, there's so much excitement over analytics, which is great. But on the other hand, there's so much market buzz and hype and overcommitment and just a lack of understanding. So I want to do my best to sort of clarify a little bit about sort of what's real and what's fun. Uh, and then, as I said, I do want to talk about people, process, and technology. And then I'll dive into Intercept specifically. But again, not to talk about the product, although there are plenty of sessions here. If you want to see demos and that stuff, you can get that in some interesting use cases. But I do want to talk about the class of machine learning that we learned at Intercept because it is ubiquitously useful. So I want to talk about that a little bit. OK, so let's start with data science. Um, lots of um, definitions around there around what data science is and is not. This is my favorite one. So there's a guy, he's actually a political scientist uh, with the, um, uh, you know, pretty famous in the data science community. Uh, his name is Conway, John Conway, and he described data science as kind of a Venn diagram. There's an intersection of three areas. There's math and stats, which you would expect. There's expertise, and in this case, we're talking about security expertise. And then there's hacking. Now, in the context of his definition, we're not talking about like white hacks or anyone like that. So this is not your pen tester. When he talks about hacking, he is specifically talking about just computer science skills, you know, whipping up something in Python so that you can deploy it at scale. So that's, that's a general idea. And he knows that there's uh, some intersection points which are worth stepping through. So you really do need all three. So if you have math and stats, just pure research, just statistical learning, and you combine that with security expertise, then what you're doing is traditional research, what I would call traditional research. So you're getting together with some security experts. You're saying, OK, theoretically, what is this um, model that can sort of help determine, detect this type of APT? Okay, So that's what I call traditional research, or 
Uh, on the other hand, if you have a computer science specialist, someone that could just deploy a system at scale, make it run on messy code, on messy data, and then combine that with uh, math and stats, then that's just pure machine learning, right? So you're sort of implementing math, putting it in motion, having it learn, trying to do stuff with it. So that's what we would call machine learning. The intersection between computer science and substantive inter uh, expertise, it's what he, not I, but he called out as the danger zone. And that's kind of a really important area to sort of be aware of. And the motivation here for starting to sort of talk about data science 101 is that if you get a guy who might be a fantastic expert in security, he's your top lead investigator, and then he goes off and sort of picks up a book on machine learning and sort of throws algorithms at it and maybe even whips up a prototype in Python and then runs it inside your environment, the reason we call this the danger zone is that without a proper grounding in statistical knowledge, you can get into trouble, right? You can generate a ton of false positives. You can generate results which look fantastic in the lab, but once you run it in your environment, it just blows up, right? So uh, selfishly, what I'm trying to do is just, I've been on a bit of education recently. I'm just trying to sort of make this entire industry aware of kind of there is a proper principled way to apply statistics to this problem space. I mean, statistics is not new. It's been around for hundreds of years. When you sort of look at a security vendor, any security vendor, it doesn't have to be us, please ask about the algorithms. But if they go on and on about the algorithms and how it's magical or they tell you it's a black box or something that they invented, there's probably a little bit of snake oil going on there or maybe a little bit of exaggeration. It really is true. There's nothing new that we're doing here. This is just good old-fashioned statistical learning. We've been doing it for hundreds of years. And I'll show you sort of how that works here today. Uh, but I do want to talk about the people side of this. So if you drill down into this a little bit further, obviously to do proper, effective data science in a problem domain like security, you need this full intersection. You need that spot in the middle. But it's very difficult to find that in one single person. That would be a unicorn. So we found that there are actually six personas that we've built up at Intersect and that we recommend to others in this space sort of think about in order to have a truly effective data science team. That doesn't mean you need six people, but these are the types of experiences and skills that you need. So the first persona is what I call the coder, right? This is the hacker. This is the guy that can take ideas and take math and wrangle code out of it. It doesn't have to be production code necessarily, but it does have to sort of run in your environment on your data, right? Without testing it in your environment, you're never going to know whether this theoretical idea actually works or not. Then we have the visualizer. A lot of what you're doing during the early stages of data science is playing around with models, trying algorithms. And the best way to see how effective that is is to do visualization. You're looking at historical data, patterns in the past. You're plotting it on a graph. You're trying out different input variables. You're trying out different statistics. And you're seeing if there are trends in the data. Um, there are ways in statistics where you can automatically find the best algorithms. But I'll be honest, right now, the best person to do that is not that machine. It's not that automatic ML learning algorithm. It's actually the human that can sort of spot trends in a way that's much more cost effective. Just plot, just plot. So you do need a visualizer. I find those, uh, those folks incredibly useful. The modelers, of course, you do need the mathematicians. Ideally, they have some grounding in traditional statistics. These folks are not rare, right? Uh, a, a data scientist who has all of these personas, that would be rare. But if you look in any sort of university or look at graduates, anyone that has any sort of background in quanti some sort of quantitative science, whether they're some, from physics or biology, if they have spent time taking a data set that's real world and trying to extract value from that data set, they'll be great. They'll be great. My background is neuroscience. Right? It's not cyber. It's not data science. Um, then you need the storyteller. Right? You need someone to be able to put these things together into a slide, into a presentation, and actually communicate it. This is surprisingly important because you need to report up to your board. You need to be able to describe why model A is better than model B. You need to be able to track progress over time and talk about things like false positives and false negatives and F1 ratios, but in a way that's meaningful to someone that actually runs a business. How do you translate statistics into meaningful business metrics? So the story is someone that is incredibly important. Uh, it's, 
he or she becomes the evangelist, excuse me, essentially for your data science team. Of course, you need the hacker. This is the person that has all the experience and the subject matter expertise. This is your pen testers, your security experts, the guy that's seen it all. The person that can remember, yeah, back in 85, we had a firewall misconfiguration, and that's what led to this data blip. It's not a real attack, right? You need that ground truth to be able to sort of build effective models. So those hackers are actually pretty important, and of course the historian, right? So the person that will remember that attack and remember the specifics around it. There's very little you can do just purely mathematically. The business context of math is really important because it matters the environment that you're deploying into. It matters how your AD domain controller is configured. It matters why it's configured this way and not the other way. Um, it, it really does have an impact on the efficacy of your routes. So those are six personas to keep in mind. Uh, that's what we've assembled over the past uh, five years at Interset. Of course, we have a slightly different use case in that we're building a solution. Uh, but whether you're uh, taking advantage of these personas in our solution or you're trying to build up this expertise and this muscle inside your own environment, just keep that in mind. Now, here's my attempt to explain AI. This is a fun one, too, because there are all kinds of um, things around sort of what AI is. And what I want to do is actually talk about it with something I hope you guys are very familiar with, which is not artificial intelligence, but human intelligence. So I'm an engineer, so I'm going to think about it in terms of a system diagram. So if I think about input, um, as humans, I think part of how we demonstrate uh, intelligence is being able to sense and perceive the world around us. We're doing processing on the photons that impact our retina to be able to turn them into more than just edges and lines and shades of gray and color. We're actually you know, doing some processing to identify, hey, this is a cat and the cat is moving rapidly. Right? This is a car and it's about to hit me. That's a Texas thing. Um, so that, that's the kind of thing that you do on the sense and perception side. So if that's the input, if you think about the output, there are ways in which we can demonstrate human intelligence on the output side as well. The way we interact with the environment around us, the way I can sort of navigate around this crazy cable here without tripping. Uh, the fact that you can sort of communicate your intent with other human beings, right? So there is an output side to intelligence as well. In addition, there's just stuff in the middle. There's things that happen squarely inside your cortex that are related to human intelligence. Obviously, we store knowledge and memories. We don't just store it as raw, scripted playbacks of things that happened in the past. We are storing it in some sort of knowledge representation inside your brain. You're also making decisions on some of those things. I've learned in the past that if this bullet flies towards me, then I should dodge. Uh, I, OK, please don't take that as a Texas thing. Um, but you are making decisions based on your experience and based on your knowledge, and you're learning. You're learning, in, and I would s simplify this a little bit by saying that you learn in two different ways. You're learning by example. You know what? This is a dog. This is a dog. This is a dog. This is a cat. This is a cat. Right? And when you're a kid, you get enough of those examples, you very quickly learn, this is a dog, this is a cat. Or you learn by observation. No one is explicitly telling you things. You're just learning because you are a fantastic pattern detector. You're seeing these things around. Okay. So if this is a description and a system diagram for human intelligence, let's map all of these squares to artificial intelligence. Let me try and sort of break this down for you. So if I look at the lay of the land, on the input side, sensing and perception, there are technologies which you have heard of, like natural language processing, which is reading a document and figuring out what parts of speech and words and concepts are stored inside the document. Speech recognition, like what you go through whenever you talk with Siri. Visual recognition, you know, parsing a video or a YouTube video or images. There are technologies that are part of AI for sure that are involved in those, that sort of spaces. On the output side, robotics, self-driving cars, navigation, uh, speech generation, those are equally valid areas of artificial intelligence that are tremendous uh, amount of research that has been going on in the last few years around that. But also the parts in the middle, right? There are areas of research, very active right now, talking about how do I represent knowledge? How do I do it in a higher level thing? It's not just a database that's flat, right? There are ways and encoding schemes where knowledge representation is very, very important for um, progressing in AI. Uh, there are ways that we are tracking and developing around how to make decisions, how to optimize for decisions, how to look at constraints and factor that into our thinking, so to speak, in the world of AI. But then, of course, the one that we've all heard about is machine learning. 
So just like how we as humans can learn by example or learn by observation, there are two types of learning that machines can do. Broadly speaking, there's supervised learning, which is learning by example. You basically feed the algorithm a bunch of pictures and say, here's a dog, here's a dog, here's a dog, here's a cat, here's a cat, here's a cat. And once you give the algorithm enough examples, it will gradually learn and very quickly with enough data, the difference between a cat and a dog. So that when you show it the next picture, it goes, that's a cat, that's a dog. And it could do that incredibly accurately if you have enough data and if you have enough answers, what I call labels. Uh, the other class of machine learning is unsupervised. This is learning by observation. Not telling the machine anything specifically, you're just saying that here's some data, there are patterns in it. I want you to figure out what those patterns are because we think they're useful. So basically, AI is a collection of all of these technologies. So when we at Intercept talk about machine learning, we are specifically talking about a very uh, small but powerful subset of AI. Okay, so that makes sense? Okay, so ML is a subset of AI. Um, specifically, there are different types of machine learning. There are tons of algorithms out there, and it gets super confusing. And I apologize on behalf of the entire marketing industry for all the confusion out there. Um, people will toss out algorithm names like recursive Bayesian estimation or neural networks or deep learning and all that stuff. But really, all, the, all those are, are different ways of implementing either supervised learning or um, unsupervised learning, broadly speaking. And even that is already a simplification. The reality is very few examples of real world machine learning is done using a single algorithm. I've never seen an actual application where you pick one algorithm and then apply it to every single problem. That's like having a hammer and applying it to everything because everything looks like a nail, right? It's not real. So what happens in real life is that we actually end up looking at the problem first and then figuring out the best algorithm or combination of algorithms for the job. So when people talk about deep learning, which is probably the most buzziest of the technologies out there, uh, deep learning is, uh, Again, I'm simplifying here, but it is thought of as a supervised machine learning. So what deep learning is really good at is something where you have a large amount of examples, like images, examples of speech, and being able to feed it answers so that deep learning can learn from that. Uh, there are ways of using deep learning for unsupervised problems, but classically speaking, that's what deep learning is really good at. And that is why, um, when you hear about deep learning, a lot of the examples are video recognition, speech generation, speech recognition. It's because there's a lot of data, because there's a certain volume of data that's required for deep learning. And the data is very, very wide. Lots of pixels, thousands of pixels, lots of sound samples, and so on. That's required for deep learning, okay? So I'll circle back to that in a second when I talk about um, anomaly detection in a second, okay? All right, so process. Uh, Anyone that starts with the algorithm first, or any vendor that talks to you and says, we're great because we use recursive Bayesian estimation or we talk about deep learning, you should instantly be skeptical. Right? The way you develop a data science solution is to always, always start with the use case. And then from the use case, you very quickly identify the data sources that are the most important and available for that use case. Without data, I don't care what algorithm you choose, it's not going to be meaningful. Right? Uh, the, in fact, it's been proven statistically by you know, statisticians that having better data trumps the better algorithm each and every single time. Right? So if you don't have messy data, um, then obviously you don't have to worry about it, but let's face it, every one of us has messy data. Right? Garbage in, garbage out. A data scientist will go through something called exploratory data analysis. This is not an intercept term, uh, this is uh, a uh, basically a standard accepted methodology in the world of data science. What I'm describing here is basically the process by which we look at the use case, identify data sources, and then there's something called feature engineering, which loosely speaking are identifying the columns of data in the available data sets that are the most useful for predicting whatever outcome and that you're interested in in the, in the use case. It's much more art than science. It's a very iterative process. That's why you have storytellers and visualizers and modelers basically having a jam session with the math. Uh, but that's essentially incredibly important. It is probably the most important stage for the efficacy of your data science. It's not picking the algorithm. It's this little jam session up front where you're trying to figure out 
what the, what the right combination of data plus math is that's going to actually lead to good results inside your environment. Okay, and then of course you have to put it into production, right? And sometimes, for if it's an internal project, that's very straightforward. You just want to be able to write a, a quick and dirty Python script that runs inside your environment. In the case of Interset, we have to deal with you know companies that have like a million EPS. It's crazy, right? So there are very specific technology choices that might factor into your thinking about what it means to go from your lab environment to your test environment. To, so excuse me, to your production environment. Okay, all make sense so far? This is fairly straightforward. So if I sort of split this up into sort of two stages in the process, and I start, talk about the technology that we found really useful at Interset. So if I think about the first phase, um, the exploratory data analysis, uh, we love R. We're very um, big fans of R, mostly because it's, one, free. We were still a startup, right? So we didn't have a big budget. But R and R Studio is free. But more importantly, there's actually something called mark, R Markdown, which essentially is like a, it's like a Word document for math, right? So you can have equations and derivations in line with commentary around, um, you know, here's why I did this, and then I tried this. So you can actually have a running, uh, almost like a journal for all the mathematical equations that you develop. And then what you can do is you can run these. These are executable documents. So you can run them against the data set, and the results get inserted into your R Markdown document. So what you end up with is a mathematical essay that has results and visualizations built into it. And then you know what you can do? You can check that stuff in. Because you've got to treat your math just as carefully as source code. Because you want to be able to version it. You want to be able to go back in time. It's, it sounds like a, a, I'm being a little bit anal about this, but if you are a software developer and you've been doing this for a long time, you know how important it is to track the source code of your code. I, I would claim that the thing, same uh, principle is equally applicable, if not more so for math. It's very easy to forget why you developed the equation a, a specific way. You want to be able to sort of revisit those decisions. You want to be able to rerun your math later on when you have additional labels or additional data sets. Okay? So very straightforward. That's what we found very uh, useful. But there's other technologies out there. There's some great Python libraries. Jupyter notebooks are pretty hot as well. So there are ways in which you can sort of achieve reproducible research, but also documented and versioned mathematics. Okay, on, going on to production, again, this is a little bit specific to our environment, but like I said, what I found is that many security data sets, uh, God damn it, you guys have a big data sets, like really, really big, but you know what? They're also really, really skinny. So what you have are a relatively small number of columns, um, you know, like, you know, how many columns in NetFlow? There's like 30. That's pretty small in the world of data science, right? We're not talking about image data or voice sampling. They're really, really skinny, but they are incredibly tall. So you've got these really tall, skinny data sets. So the technologies that we chose to process that type of high volume, uh, fairly structured, but very fast moving data sets is basically the traditional big data stack. So uh, we use technologies like Flume and NiFi and Kafka to essentially move data around. These are things that exist in the open source world. They came from companies like LinkedIn and Facebook. They're fantastic at moving around data very quickly in a very robust manner. Um, we use uh, th uh, technologies like Spark and HBase to do our processing. Uh, roughly speaking, there are two parts to machine learning. There's the part that's learning, which is getting smarter and smarter about uh, as it is more data. And then there's a second part, which is called scoring, which is essentially, think of it as running a model. So taking um, a current event and then running a prediction on it. Uh, what we've done in order to achieve the velocity and scalability of our system if we, is we split those two parts out. So all of the training and the learning essentially runs um, on top of Phoenix and HBase. Phoenix, by the way, basically makes your HBase big data database look like SQL. So if you have developers that come from the BI world and they know how to write SQL, guess what? you can now turn them into big data developers, right? You can store terabytes of data in, in HBase and still be able to run SQL around it. It's fantastic. So we use that for essentially getting smarter and smarter, building new baselines. And then for scoring, if you're thinking about sort of as quickly as possible, as real time as possible, taking an event and then running a model against it, Spark is great for that, right? So that's why we chose that stack. And then, of course, uh, we want to store our results in a way that was scalable, but we wanted to decouple it from the computation system. So we chose Elastic for that. You know, we recognize there's a lot of the ELK stack here, uh, which is also good because if you have a security team that's familiar with ELK, guess what? They can use Kibana the, all the ways they normally do. They can point it at Elastic and they can process the result. 
So that's the stack that we chose. It's worked great for us for the last five years. Um, in fact, we were uh, one of the original uh, Spark developers featured in some of the old uh, O'Reilly 1.0 books on Spark. If you crack open that book, you'll see Intercept, you'll see my name in there, you'll see my team's name in there. We had a lot of fun um, basically helping pioneer the use of Spark for these large-scale machine learning um, use cases. All right, so speaking of use cases, uh, with that out of the way, let me apply to the use case I am the most familiar with right now, which is the use of anomaly detection and unsupervised machine learning specifically at Intercept. And the use case that we stumbled across uh, five years ago is uh, just as relevant today as it is um, Five, as it was five years ago, which was to automatically include identify threats, but do it in a way where you could sort of help the team focus. Among the 13 billion events that you see here, uh, can you show me the one dozen areas in the place to look? And what we wanted to do was do something better than the standard approach. So let's read this together, right? So this is what uh, the poor SOC teams had to do five years ago. If the mail is from the departing insider and the message was sent in the last 30 days and the recipient is not in the organization's domain and the total bytes sent by day are more than a specified threshold, then send an alert, right? This is not what I would call AI, right? There's nothing like this in any of the um, blocks that I described. This is, let's face it, this is a rule, right? There's no learning here. Basically, everything is coming from the human, right? And as I read this out, I'm sure some of you guys that run SOC teams, you're sort of seeing the same rule that you would implement. The problem with this approach is that you're never going to get it right because what is the, the single threshold that's going to work on everyone in your population? And of course, that threshold does not exist, right? Because the, the dude that's in HR that is always sending out resumes day in, day out, he is going to require a higher threshold than a software engineer who should never be leaking source code to his home Gmail account. Does that make sense? So that specified threshold doesn't exist. Um, so you need to be able to do this at scale. And the way to do that is to essentially learn the right threshold, learn the right distribution for every single user in your population. And that's what brings us to anomaly detection. So the basic idea behind anomaly detection is to, one, baseline everyone. This is why it's a big data approach, right? You want to be able to look at every user, every account, every machine, every IP address, every file, everything that matters for your use case, and give it a number, where that number represents normal behavior. The reason that number is important is because if you can get everyone down to a number that represents normal, and then you can take current behavior in real time and take the difference between normal and current behavior, then basically the thing with the biggest difference that becomes your anomaly. That's how you find the most unusual. Okay, does that all make sense? Okay. All right, so let me confess. Um, I was told that this was an hour long talk, um, and I'm going through a midlife crisis right now, so I decided instead of talking about anomaly detection, I'd just show pictures of my daughter. She's pretty awesome. Uh, so that's Rachel. Uh, this is when she was obviously a little bit uh, younger than she is now. She's now 11. I thought that was. Here's another one with chopsticks. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, here's one. Uh, I swear I wasn't trying to take a picture of the Roomba, which I just purchased. I thought it was just kind of funny that she was in the laundry basket, which we no longer use, and so on and so forth. Um, there's a more recent one uh, earlier where she had there's <laughs> there's her second birthday party. But you know, actually, no. I, 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 obviously, I'm making this up. Um, with Rachel, there was actually something really interesting that I observed, where where when she was zero, um, I was sort of obviously observing a lot of data from this newborn, right? This first time dad. And, and I noticed that there was a dent in the side of her head. And I, and I went to my favorite doctor, Dr. Google, right? Does everyone do this? So I went to Dr. Google and said, dent in head. So, you know, this was the alert. And Dr. Google said, well, this is obviously a case of plagiocephaly. Right? And that was my conclusion. So I said, okay, I found an anomaly. I'm going to go to my doctor and say, good God, Rachel has plagiocephaly. <laughs> and you know what? He told me that this was a false positive. He said, you know what? This is totally normal, right? This is not abnormal for her, right? It's normal because your skull is still shifting. This is not. So I went back home and went to my office and said, okay, it's all good. Good. No, nothing so much. But then I noticed that you know she had too many bowel movements, right? Uh, this has got to be unusually high. Went to my doctor. He said, "Look, 
dude, this is normal. It's fine. And then I said, she's spitting up a lot. And he said, no, it's nothing to worry about. So he said, I found all of these things that I thought were abnormal, but they all ended up being false positives. And so he actually gave me anomaly detection advice. So he said, look, rigid rules and thresholds don't work because they are given in general to the entire population. Every baby is different. What you gotta do is learn what's normal for your baby first, and then you'll be able to sort of understand what exactly is abnormal. And don't just call me whenever you find one thing that's unusual. I want you to, I want you to wait until multiple things are unusual. Right? I want you to sort of look for multiple clues. And then he said, you know what? It would be great if everyone took this advice. If every parent understood what every baby was, individually, separately, not averaging it out across the entire population. You see where I'm going here? And then look for multiple deviations so that you can sum it up. So they're not just bothering me for a single thing. And that's how you scale up anomaly detection. You want a lot of babies, a lot of data. You want to analyze everyone um, separately. You want to look for multiple clues. And if you can do that, then you can have fewer cases with a low false positive rate. So there are actually two levels of math that my doctor was cleverly describing to me. So level one is the symptom level, right? So for every baby, uh, let's uh, we call it the concept of unique normal. Every unique entity has a different normal. So I want you to compute normal for every single one. And then I don't want you to just wait for one symptom. I want multiple symptoms together. That's how I can sort of reduce noise, right? Because now you're more and more certain that there's something truly bad going on there, not something that's sort of uh, just innocent and one single anomaly. So you want multiple anomalies, unless it's really, really severe. And then the second level is at the baby level, right? So if you could sort of score every baby in a large population individually, then and if you could present to the doctor just the highest risk score associated with everyone in the entire population of babies, that's how he could save time. He could just focus in on the ones that has the highest risk score. So essentially, that's what we did at Intersect. Um, uh, I should give Rachel a, a bit of a, I don't know, percentage of my earnings here. So essentially, here, here, I mean, here's the deal, right? Let's suppose that we have a data that feeds in and it, uh, is giving us login records or access records. And we just know that Anne Funderburg is working at an usual hour for her, right? For her, because unique normal, right? Every baby is different. And we can give it a number, right? We quantify it, and that number is 15. If we stop there and we just sounded an alert, that could easily be a false positive, right? Because maybe Anne is uh, doing something because uh, it's the midnight hour and she's burning the midnight hour because um, there's a big deadline due tomorrow, right? So, uh, however, she's also VPNing from China, and that's unusual for her. Right? So she's not a Chinese employee. We've never seen this IP range before. And she's also accessing a combination of file shares that she's never done before, and that's unusual as well. And she touches one of those file folders an unusual number of times as, as if she's trying to figure out the ACL. And if she's transacting an unusually large number of files from that folder to, say, an unsanctioned cloud service, and so on and so forth. So your intuition as a security expert now, not as a parent, although that applies as well, is that the more of these anomalies coincide on the same thing, the less this starts to feel like a false positive, and the more Anne Funderburg starts to feel like a person of interest. And that's really all we're doing. What we're doing is we're doing anomaly detection en masse. We're computing normal in multiple ways, multiple symptoms you know, across a vast population. We're assembling clues together as if we're corroborating evidence so that we can be more and more sure that the lead that we're giving to you in this case would drive uh, that lead from a low score, like a 15, all the way to a highly confident score, like a 96. And that's, how, that's essentially how we do uh, what we do. All make sense so far? OK, very good. All right, so this is my mathematical architecture slide. Uh, so there's one takeaway I would suggest uh, for your um, highly effective, pragmatic data science teams is to build a math architecture. Just like how um, you wouldn't purchase a uh, software solution without seeing a technology architecture so that you can understand fit and understand the edges of the implementation, there's a very similar concept in the world of data science. So our math architecture kind of looks like this. We have some 
random combination of data sources, right? We don't know in advance, right? Maybe it's one data source that made multiple data sources. We send that to our system, and they extract features. These are the symptoms of interest, right? So we're interested in logins. We're interested in the access patterns. We're looking in, interested in the times of day. We're looking in which, we're interested in which processes access the network and which processes uh, does not. So these features that you developed during your exploratory data analysis process, those are the features that you want to parse in real time from the data source. Then you run them through the models. Because we're constantly looking for multiple systems, you're not running these models serially. You're running them in parallel. For you to be highly detective in your anomaly detection-based system, you want to run as many of these algorithms as possible because you never know which combination of clues are going to be relevant for a brand new attack right? or a brand new um, never seen before black swan event. So as many of these as possible. In our world, we don't even turn off the low probability events. They all emit these scores, which tells us how probable and improbable a specific event is. And then essentially, we want to sort of have this notion of corroborative evidence. So what we're doing is, um, what you see here is a summation. You might remember from high school math. Uh, we're doing essentially integration. So we're integrating across all of these clues together so that we can assemble the risk score. There's something here called logistic squash. It's not super important right now for a one-on-one -on -one class. But essentially what this is doing is this is compressing the possible output values for your risk score into a number between 0 to 100. That's why this logistic squash exists. Uh, mathematicians in the room, you all recognize this is kind of the sweet spot for neural networks and perceptrons. The reason this is important is, again, very pragmatic. This is all about math and motion. Your security teams are not going to understand the concept of an unbounded score. Right? If I didn't have this here, the lowest possible score is zero. But because I don't know in advance how many data sources and, and models I'm going to be running, and I want to be able to add that over time, the highest possible score is actually infinity. Right? If I go to up to an ordinary muggle and say the highest possible score is infinity, no one understands what that, have, what that means. Right? So you've got to compress it down into something more actionable and comprehensible. The other side of it is think about it deploying such a system in production. You're going to want to build run books. Run books that say things like when the score hits 80 and this person is in this group, then you want to shut off their login access. Like you want to build rules like that. And without a score that is relatively static and can stay fixed over time, even as you add more models or deploy additional data sets, uh, without that stability, you're just never going to have a pragmatically uh, replayable playbook that you can deploy. Okay? All right, so this is our mathematical architecture. And you know what? Holy cow, does it work freaking well. So I, I mean, this is not the customer story presentation. We've got a couple hours you know, tomorrow if you're interested. We can tell you some of the things that we found last year. But I just want to show you um, a couple of examples of the stuff that this very straightforward approach. And whether you use interested or whether you build it yourself, like I, I honestly don't care. But I just want to sort of highlight the fact that this stuff is incredibly effective. So this is a US-based financial um, uh, institution. They're pretty important. And uh, basically, there was, uh, in April, a guy that came in and uh, on the weekend. And he never did that before. And I think it was late in the morning early in the morning or late at night, I can't remember the details. But again, that was unusual for him. And he printed uh, 250 pages, and, uh, and that was unusual for him. It wasn't unusual for everyone, uh, but we were still able to identify this event. It was a good old-fashioned print and run. Um, if you start, uh, yeah, OK, so 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, now, it's important to understand, again, uh, if this was implemented as a rule, there would have been a ton of noise, right? Because this bank did have employees that regularly came in on the weekend. This bank did have employees that printed up hundreds of documents, you know, if not more, in the legal department. But the fact that this was unusual for this person allowed us a precision to be able to identify this event. And for each one of these examples, if you just focus on the blue squares, I try and highlight for you the, the data sources that, we, that were specifically involved in that particular event and the types of anomaly models that we had built, just to give you a sense for the, the generic applicability of this type of approach. So in this case, uh, we analyzed DLP and printer logs. Those are the data sources. And if you look at the types of anomalies, this is very simple. Uh, unusual time of day, unusual day of the week, and unusual volume. And in my 201 class, I'll actually derive some of the equations for this. That's supposed to inspire you, not scare you. 
it, it's actually pre it's actually pretty cool. Uh, this is cool as well. So this is a fun one for me personally because this was in another security vendor. Again, not Microfocus, not ArcSight, uh, not Intercept, but these guys, uh, we had uh, been implemented in their SOC. Now, because this was a SOC of a security vendor, they had every product under the sun, as you can imagine. They had a pretty large portfolio. But they still missed this attack, which we found. Essentially, there was um, a low and slow. So someone had apparently infiltrated their environment about a year ago. And as we were installed, we had a backlog of AD records that spanned a year, which we were just slowly slowing through. And we basically very quickly surfaced the fact that there was a guest account. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, because the, um, the AP whatever was involved was also erasing its tracks along the way, we, we weren't able to identify the original set of infected accounts, but we did see that they were sort of escalating to the guest account, and they were basically jumping from machine to machine, doing a little bit of recon, trying to find something interesting to, to take. And uh, things got really serious when it hit a group of servers that was associated with the next generation architecture and products associated with a security vendor. So in this case, there's just a single data source, Active Directory. Active Directory has some really great event codes that track logins and access attempts, whether successful or failed. And some of the models that, um, that uh, came to play here are the ones that I've listed here for you. All right, in terms of uh, detail around the, um, the use case that I presented at the keynote, I just want to give you a little bit more insight. Specifically, the, uh, the high-tech firm that sort of found these 11 additional uh, data thieves uh, were able to do that using just a single data source, which was source code log files. They already had plenty of agents, so they didn't want to deploy any additional agents. But again, our philosophy is uh, let's just work with the data that you've already got, right? Let's see what we can do with that. Because, you know, uh, you always want to sort of decouple data strategy from the analytic strategy. You don't want to wait for clean data. You just want to start with the single data source that you've already got that's already clean. And so that's what we did here. So it, as I mentioned in Keynote, we had uh, 30 source code models at the time. I think we're up to 35 now, so we've been getting smarter and smarter on different patterns of attack related to source code. And again, I'll derive some of the mathematics in the 2-1 section. But uh, some of the ones that were interesting here was um, unusual day and time for source code access, accessing an unusual source code project for that user. That was that cluster model that I showed you earlier that was done with using, um, I think, uh, Louvain. Uh, clustering, if, for those interested, uh, taking an unusually large number of source code files, and, uh, checking out more files than expected. In terms of the ratio, how much you check it versus check you check out is actually very predicted, predictable. A good feature for source code. And I, I, by the way, that works really well with uh, SharePoint as well and file share data. Okay, so that was really good. Um, this is uh, this is basically my last slide. Uh, we've been doing this for a ton of time. Um, I'm a big fan of being as open and as transparent as, uh, as possible because I've just learned that you know, I don't want to burn any customers. I don't want to sort of um, you know, mislead you guys. I want to be as upfront as I can about what's doable and what's difficult with machine learning because it's not all perfect. I think math is magical, but it's not magic. Right? So to the extent where I can be as transparent as possible and help you understand the edges of what we can do, um, I'd love to have a conversation with you. There are a ton of intercenters here at this event. There's a ton of uh, presentations that we have. I've got my 201 version of this where I'm going to actually go a little bit deeper to the specific algorithms that we have, show you some examples, hopefully inspire you on the application of problem methods for anomaly detection. Um, I uh, have a lot of friends here with me today that have tracks on customer use cases, on the difference between um, machine learning in the abstract and how you get it to scale in a real environment, about the theming aspects, the interplay between correlation in ESM and analytics in Intercept. You know, so some really good and hopefully pragmatic and useful sessions that you're happy to attend. And thank you so much for your attention. I would love to take on any questions if there are any. Again, not a threat. That was supposed to be inspirational, especially if they're math questions. Yes, sir. Uh, we are based on top of. So, sorry, how do you? Uh, so the question was: um, Is there any special software or hardware that this stuff runs on? Uh, first and foremost, we run both on-prem or in the cloud. 
Uh, there's no live internet connection run required at all. You can be completely air gapped. Um, when it's uh, on-prem, we run on top of a existing Hadoop infrastructure. So whether it's Hortonworks or Cloudera, that is essentially the platform upon which we deploy um, because this is a big data solution. So those are technologies that we run on top of. Good for people uh, all have a big data strategy. My mic is it out. The, the good news for people that have a big data strategy, we can run as an app essentially on top of the existing big data infrastructure. Uh, we were big data from the very beginning. We're big data native, so to speak. And so uh, we're able to scale our and all analytics on top of any other existing big data workloads. That tends to be pretty useful. Uh, you can also deploy us in the cloud. It's not a different solution. It's the same solution. But we have optimized it for uh, cloud environments, including AWS serverless optimizations, which can be very useful for cost efficiencies um, as opposed to, say, a very naive EC2-based deployment. No special hardware, but you do need enough hardware to be able to sufficiently run um, a Hadoop cluster. I'm not quite sure how to ask this question, but I was thinking of your example with your dog. What if normal, what if what you check normal is when she's got the flu? Or, you know, in, a, in an environment, normal is an already infected organization where mm -hmm. somebody's already doing something bad. Right. That's a, a problem? That's a great question. That's a crash question. So the question was, uh, what, if my, uh, what if when I measured normal in my daughter, who's perfect, by the way, but so this would never happen. But when you do measure normal, let's suppose that she's sick, or so there's something that we're measuring that is sort of abnormal from the very beginning. And if I translate that into the world of security and anomaly detection, your question really is, what if there's a zero-day bad guy in your environment? So there's a guy that's already in your environment. He's bad from the very beginning. And we actually work that through peer-based comparisons. So it's one thing to be able to uh, baseline and compare against past behavior, right? So you want to be able to sort of learn from the past so that you can sort of identify differences and anomalies based on what's happened before for that individual person or baby. Uh, when, when we at Intercept sort of looked at that, we said, okay, that's pretty good, right? But we had the same question. What if I have a zero-day bad guy? Right? He's always been bad from the very beginning. So that's why we actually compare you to others like you. So every entity gets compared to their own cluster. So we use statistical methods to be able to find these peer groups. You can define it, but that's a pain in the ass, right? Because AD is really messy and always out of date, right? But if you could learn, for example, the same set of people that access the same file shares as you do, uh, but you're still different from them, then even though you've been bad from the very beginning, you can still find differences. So that's a workaround for you. Other questions? It's about the performance uh, to find uh, different, uh, different data and processing. Um, what is the different intersect to, to do that? Uh, so the question was around performance. I, I want to just make sure I answered the question. Is the question around sort of um, how we can ensure a performant intersect system or? Yes? OK. okay so uh, is to. Sort of separate the training and the scoring. Do you, do you remember how I sort of made the point where machine learning is divided up into two parts? There's a uh, training and a scoring. So the training part, that's the part that is getting smarter and smarter based on um, more data. Uh, the scoring part is the part that's more important to be as real time as possible. Right? Scoring basically means that as soon as the event comes in, you want to be able to quantify how neutral that particular event is. When you decouple that, basically in practice, you're running scoring continuously all the time, as real time as possible. The training can be a separate process. Because guess what? Learning normal is not critical to be real time. Because normal, by definition, does not change quickly. So if you can learn, if you can run your training cycle once a day, once a week, that's perfectly fine. As long as you can get the bad guy something unusual, based on what you've learned about more normal. Whether it's 24 hours ago or one week ago, you can still catch it. You can ensure performance just by separating the two. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. Can you use the, your tool as a means to determine identities in an organization and how they are used without having to go through lots of Q&A with different individuals? What a great question. <laughs> 
So, so the question was, can we use this tool, or I guess broadly speaking, this approach to be able to infer identities and, you know, based on observation? The, the answer is yes. Um, I, actually, it's interesting. Um, do you remember that high-tech uh, uh, source code theft that, uh, that I showed? And during the keynote, I showed a cluster visualization that showed um, the, essentially the access patterns of all the engineers across all the source code repositories. Basically, the four clusters represent common access patterns. Uh, did that, and I said, it's great that you found all these bad guys. Can I also use this cluster model to be able to define um, least privileged ACLs around my source code repositories, right? Because all of a sudden, I have data-driven uh, analytics that tells me exactly the way to access to source code in a way that's not good day-to-day. -day, uh, when it's a startup, got quite like uh, this analytical method for this slightly different uh, use case? Yes, but we can't because we're a startup. That's now different now that we're part of MicroFocus. We had to say no at the startup because we only had so many people and I need to serve a lot of product, not one specific one case at the park. Uh, but now that we're part of MicroFocus, one of the reasons I'm so excited is because I'm uh, all these uses for the same technology that we've refined and hardened at Intercept over the past five years to completely different problem areas in identity, in uh, these in the four to five stuff, there's so much stuff that we can do. So that's why I'm excited to be here. Yes, sir. In crypto, uh, the math has to be public in order to prove that it's doing what you think it's doing. Absolutely. There's something about these algorithms and, and competitors uh, maybe hiding that, right? Having the black box. How open is the math in the intercept? I am as open as you want me to be. Like the one, one of the things that I love doing is going into a customer with a super skeptical, and you guys are, and rightfully so, right? But uh, you, you bring in your data science team or a chief data officer, and I'm happy to go through all the algorithms. I'll go through some of them um, you know, during my 201. I, I think we are known as being sort of transparent, you know, surprisingly transparent about the way we do it. Because like I said, I, I really don't have anything to hide. Um, anyone that says that this is magic or secret sauce or black box, you gotta be a little bit skeptical, right? Um, these are battle-tested, well-understood statistical algorithms that existed for centuries. We just apply them in a very effective way, I think, for cybersecurity use cases. Okay, I think we're almost out of time. Any final question? Okay, last question. Are you, are you working on any of um integration with as a sort of intersect with other uh, components in the Microsoft, you know, like the microfocus. Microfocus, yeah. I said Microsoft for the first two weeks as well when I when I was acquired. Um, so the question was, are we working on integration? Yeah. Or, you know, for remediation of any of those anomalies, are you actually sending out any, um, calling any, anything into action from, you know, any of the other tools? I, I, love, I love the fact that I, I'm trying to be vendor neutral and you guys are asking me all these vendor questions. So the question was, are we working on any other uh, integrations with the rest of MicroFocus? And, you know, for example, can we take results and send them back? Uh, the answer is absolutely yes. Like, I, I can't list them off for you because I'd get in trouble, but boy, are we, right? There's a lot of integrations that you can, you, yeah, you can sort of imagine that make tons of sense and we're just trying to, keep up with the demands on our small organization and integrate as quickly as possible. There is one path that I will highlight because it already exists today. So we're not trying to replace your SIM. We're not trying to be your system of record, right? You've already got a SIM, you've already got a system of record. We're not trying to be that. But what we are trying to do and what we have always tried to do is read data from your SIM or your data lake or your files, wherever the data is, we don't care, right? But we process that data, we can run the results, we have a glorious UI, it's beautiful, but you don't need to use our UI because you probably already have a pane of glass. You probably already have a source system or a ticketing system. So we actually have always made it easy for you to take our results and send it back to your SIM or your swim lane or your JIRA or Mephisto or whatever, right? So um, what that means, Today, you can already process data with an ESM. You can have us analyze it, and you can use our UI, but you can also take every single one of the results and send it back to your SIM for further processing. Okay, so that exists today. That's nothing you have to work for, but we, we are doing some amazing things. In deeper integrations where you found that that thing that you want to go out Yep, yep. You know, that you want to Yep. Yeah, 
that, again, that, that exists today. So we have a generic sort of output um, mechanism for invoking stream services through a RESTful API. We'll send content triggers so that you can shut off access inside NetIQ. That's a perfect scenario. Okay. You don't need to wait for that, but we'll like, come back next year and we'll probably have, be able to talk about some of the deeper integration that we're done. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm out of time, sir, but uh, can we sort of talk after? Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs>